So hands down, fasting is your absolute best strategy for cancer. Now the diet for preventing cancer should be different than the diet you would be on if you got cancer. And I will discuss this in this video. Now, before I begin, I wanna let you know that nothing in this video uh, is intended to replace your medical care. In fact, I'm not gonna make any claims that any of this information is going to prevent, cure your cancer. So I'm gonna talk about all the mechanisms of how fasting can greatly help you. And I wanna show you something that could greatly benefit a person if for some reason fasting is not an option. Let's say for example, they're too thin, they're too frail, and they need some other option. I'm gonna show you what I would recommend a little later in this video. Fasting is one of the oldest therapies known to man. Hippocrates has talked about the massive benefits of fasting long ago. Historically, nearly every single religion practices fasting. So let's just dive right in. It's very, very important to understand some differences between normal cells and cancer cells. Cancer cells originate from normal cells. What happens is this, a certain thing in your cell becomes damaged. And that thing is called the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the energy factory of the cell. It produces all the energy for your body. And so after the mitochondria become damaged, the body through a adaptive survival mechanism starts to switch over its metabolism to a different way of burning fuel. It starts to ferment sugar. And when it starts to ferment sugar and turn into a cancer cell, it starts to become extremely hungry for glucose. Now, it also eats other things, which we're gonna talk about, but sugar provides the most fuel for a cancer cell. In the process of a normal cell becoming a cancer cell, it also loses its mortality. In other words, it becomes immortal. So your normal cells actually have a limit. They can only live so long, but the cancer cells live forever. Cancer cells grow faster than normal cells, and they basically take over the body. So the first mechanism of fasting in relationship to a cancer cell is that fasting helps to starve off the fuel. It starves off your glucose because guess what? You're not eating anything. So no eating, no glucose. And so you help to prevent feeding the cancer cell. Now, this was discovered by Professor Otto Warburg, who won the Nobel Prize in medicine. Now, in extreme conditions, normal cells can temporarily ferment sugar, as in a severe infection like sepsis or a severe uh, pathogen invasion in your body or an intense exercise or trauma, your body can switch to ferment sugar. So this mechanism is a survival mechanism for fuel. All right, that's mechanism one. Number two, certain cancers can also live on an amino acid called glutamine, as well as another amino acid called arginine. Now the problem is glutamine, which makes up certain proteins, is very widespread. It's in a lot of different foods. So when you fast, you're not consuming glutamine. So you're gonna deprive the cell of this other fuel. There are certain um, therapies out there right now that are using medications to block glutamine. And one is called Dawn, which is a glutamine inhibitor. There are also natural glutamine inhibitors as well. And green tea with its phytonutrient EGCG also has the capacity to block glutamine, creating an anti-cancer effect. Also other phytonutrients in green tea are very anti-cancer. Now I wanna clarify this glutamine amino acid. Avoiding glutamine is not going to prevent you from getting cancer. So if you don't have cancer, you don't want to avoid glutamine. You would only want to avoid glutamine if you had cancer. So I just wanted to make that clarification. So the problem is you can't fast forever. Eventually you're gonna to have to eat. So what type of diet is going to limit the amount of glutamine and arginine because they're in a lot of different foods? Well, one thing you wanna do is not do a high protein diet. It's better to do a low protein diet if you have cancer and a moderate protein diet if you're just trying to prevent cancer. But whey protein has a very large amount of arginine. So I would avoid any type of protein powders, especially whey protein. And nuts are also high in arginine 
except for the pistachio. So maybe eat more pistachios on that protocol. All right, that's the protein component. Now, the third mechanism I wanna talk about in relationship to fasting is this concept of autophagy. You know, autophagy is not a thing, it's a condition. And autophagy means self-eating. It sounds like it's something destructive, but it's something very, very constructive because it's a survival mechanism and your body is eating up damaged proteins and it's recycling them into new proteins as well as fuel. So autophagy is an alternative fuel source and it can also degrade waste products and it recycles damaged proteins that you're not using anyway and it repairs things and it cleans up things and it has a powerful effect on cancer. It helps to shrink tumors and it can actually inhibit cancer development. Now, there's different types of autophagy. One type is called mitophagy. Now, what is mitophagy? That is autophagy for the mitochondria. So your body goes in there and it starts to clean up the mitochondria that are damaged. Remember I talked about the cause of cancer is damaged mitochondria? Well, when you fast, you increase mitophagy. Also, autophagy is a very potent anti-inflammatory mechanism. So you're going to drop inflammation. And the thing about inflammation is that cancer tends to spread into inflammation. And this is why people tend to develop cancer in areas of old injury and areas of inflammation. So it's very, very important to keep inflammation at a minimum. Now, this next point is very, very interesting. Autophagy also cleans up carcinogens. Carcinogens are those things that promote cancer. They can trigger cancer. That would be like pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides. Now, radiation can also trigger cancer, but autophagy is not going to clean up radiation. Now, there's another piece of this that is very, very important. There are certain conditions that damage your ability to perform autophagy. So those things are obesity, drinking a lot of alcohol, being a diabetic, viral infections, having a fatty liver, having chronic inflammation. All of these things in a chronic nature will increase the risk of cancer because there's less autophagy. And if you haven't guessed it, the biggest thing that triggers autophagy is fasting. All right, the next point I wanna bring up, number four, is your immune system. What fasting can do to your immune system. And this is very, very important to bring up because the two main things that they do for cancer are chemotherapy and radiation therapy. Both of these things destroy your immune system. So your immune system is really a key factor in preventing cancer as well as directly treating cancer. Your immune system has several mechanisms to kill cancer both directly and indirectly. So the killer T cells can directly kill cancer cells. The helper T cells can indirectly recruit certain white blood cells to kill cancer. And the real amazing thing about fasting is that fasting triggers your immune system stem cells in your bone marrow to boost up your immune system and even regrow an immune system that is damaged. And when people do radiation therapy and chemo, adding fasting to that protocol can decrease the side effects from radiation and chemotherapy, as well as enhance the effectiveness of chemo and radiation therapy. Now, the reason why the medical profession does not recommend fasting in place of these other therapies that have side effects is simply because they would either lose their license or go to jail. Because the way that the laws are written, if you're a medical doctor, you have to practice medicine and there's certain protocols that you have to follow. So you will never see fasting as a primary uh, initial therapy. It will always be used uh, as an adjunct to medications. Now, I wanna to touch on the fifth mechanism, hormones. There are three hormones to briefly talk about. One is called IGF number one, and that's produced by the liver. That is a hormone that's very anabolic. It makes things get bigger like muscles. It also can stimulate the growth of cancer. But I wanna mention this, if someone doesn't have cancer, it's not going to trigger cancer. 
It's only when you get cancer that the IGF number one can cause cancer to spread. So fasting decreases IGF number one. The next hormone, insulin, okay? Insulin is also an anabolic hormone. Insulin has been known to increase the risk of getting cancer. And in the presence of insulin, the benefits from fasting go way down to zero. So a lot of the benefits from fasting and autophagy occur when the insulin is low. In fact, you can't get into fasting or autophagy without first lowering insulin. So keeping insulin low is a very, very key thing. And then we have estrogen. Estrogen in excess can trigger breast cancer and cancer of the uterus and cancer of the ovary. There are certain chemotherapies that block estrogen production. So anything that can increase estrogen is something you want to limit if you're trying to treat cancer and prevent cancer. Like milk, you want to limit dairy if you have cancer. Soy products. Soy is very estrogenic, especially the soy protein isolates. Birth control pills are estrogen. Hormone replacement therapy has estrogen in it. So of course, if you have cancer and you're taking birth control pills and hormone replacement therapy, probably not the best idea. Now, iodine from sea kelp is a wonderful natural remedy to help balance your estrogens. It's really good for things like fibrocystic breast or ovarian cysts. And then you have DIM, which is a concentrated cruciferous product that helps to reduce estrogen in your body. And because it comes from cruciferous, it's anti-cancer. One mechanism being just lowering the amount of estrogen. All right, mechanism number six, and I've already talked about this a little bit, inflammation. The more you can cut down inflammation, the less risk you have for cancer. Cancer follows inflammation. A lot of people develop cancer in areas of old injury, areas of inflammation. I remember when I was in practice, uh, one lady had cancer in a certain part of her breast. And I asked her, have you ever injured that part of your breast? And when she thought about it, she remembered having some trauma in that exact location. Another uh, patient came in with uh, cancer of the brainstem. Okay. I asked him if he ever injured the brainstem. He said, no, but I did fall off of a roof once and I landed on my head. I said, that would be injury to your brainstem. But out of all the things that can rid inflammation, fasting is at the top of the list. And fasting also can boost the antioxidant networks that you have in your body, thereby minimizing the free radical damage and lessening the damage to the mitochondria. All right, now we wanna talk about the, the seventh mechanism here in relationship to fasting, which brings up this other topic, and that is ketones. You now know that cancer can live on glucose and two amino acids, glutamine and arginine. But unfortunately, ketones can provide cancer with the cellular membrane structure that the cancer cell needs. So in other words, just because someone's on a ketogenic diet and they're low in sugar does not bulletproof them from getting cancer. So ketones that come from fat provide the raw material for the membranes around cancer cells. So I didn't know this initially. This is some new information that I tried to suppress for for quite some time, but it kept coming up. So I finally dug into some of this research to kind of um, accept the fact that ketones, unfortunately, can feed the cancer some of the structural parts that it needs, even though ketones themselves have an anti-tumor effect, okay? So here's the dilemma or problem that we're in, but I'm gonna give you a solution. If we can't eat carbs and, we are, and we're not supposed to eat much protein, and now we can't eat fat, what the heck can we eat? We can't fast forever. Now I've mentioned in other videos that I am doing some research or supporting some research in Europe related to a non-toxic way to block ketones. And even some of you have supported this research, which you probably have gotten an email on the updates, but this is very exciting research and so far so good. And even though this research is being done in mice, you always start with mice before you do human studies. So this is based on some very interesting data about cancer cells versus normal cells. So with cancer cells, there's really only one door 
for ketones to feed its membranes. Okay, there's just one door, one chemical pathway. And if that chemical pathway was blocked, you could potentially starve off the cancer from getting any raw material for its membranes. But the question that came up from that is what about normal cells? Do they just have one door? No, they don't. The membranes from normal cells can come from fatty acids, not just ketones. So the goal is to block this door, this chemical pathway that is allowing these ketones to make membranes for the cancer cells. And this door is called SCOT, which stands for a very long chemical name, which I'm not going to give you at this time. And there just happens to be SCOT inhibitors, okay, both in the medication area, as well as using natural things that have less side effects. And that is the area that we are evaluating right now, doing studies in Europe on mice, and so far with great success. So the following SCOT inhibitors are the ones that are showing the most promise. Number one, we have alpha lipoic acid. Number two, garcinia. Then we have red algae and then black seed oil and then garlic. Okay. Garlic handles a slightly different, it's called a salvage pathway, which I'm not going to get into now, but garlic is very, very important. These are all SCOT inhibitors that work synergistically to help starve the cancer of its raw material for its cellular membranes. Now, if you want more details on the strategy, there's some additional studies which are quite fascinating, and I put those in the description below. Now, before I get into the dosages, I just wanna let you know, I'm not making any claims this is going to cure or prevent any cancer. This is a protocol that I would take if I had cancer, okay? All right, alpha lipoic acid. I would start out at 0.4 grams and gradually over the course of three weeks, increase that amount to 1.8 grams per day. Now, as far as Garcinia, I would start at 1.2 grams and gradually increase to three grams over a course of three weeks. Red algae, I would take eight grams per day. Black seed oil, I would take 500 milligrams twice a day. And then garlic, I would take 500 milligrams four times a day, but that would only be if I'm not consuming actual garlic in my meals or in other forms. So this protocol is designed to shut that door so this pathway called SCOT cannot be an option for the cancer to get its raw material for its membranes. Now, another question that you might be thinking about, the ketogenic diet, increases ketones, but fasting also increases ketones even more than a ketogenic diet. So how can fasting help someone with cancer if it's feeding the cancer cell ketones? Well, the answer is this, when you do fasting, you also create at the same time an epigenetic effect, way higher than the effect of just taking ketones. So there's a lot of other things that are going on when you're doing fasting that apparently override this mechanism of ketones feeding the cancer membrane through Scott. All right, let's talk about the fasting protocol. There's two different protocols. One is for prevention. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the best thing you can do right now is to do whatever you can to prevent cancer because once you get cancer, you have the medical profession who is giving you all this information and putting the fear of God in you that you better do this and you better not do this. And it's a massive confusion, not to mention friends and family giving you their two cents, not to mention the fear of having cancer and unsure what to do. So at a very minimum, you want to be doing 16 hours of fasting and have a eight hour eating window. And when you eat, you want to do low carb. So the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting is the best way to prevent cancer because that's going to prevent the damage in the mitochondria. All right, so what do you do if you have cancer? Well, you wanna do regular fasting, but you wanna step it up to at least 18 hours fasting with a six hour eating window. And if you could, I would do more than that. I would do like a 20 hour fasting with a four hour eating window or even do OMAD where you're eating one meal a day. Now, in addition to that, I would do weekly fasting for two days. That's 48 hours, very, very important, every week. 
If you can't do two days of fasting, then do two days of 500 calories. Now, to me, that's going to be a lot more difficult because you haven't really adapted to that and you're just lowering calories. And if you eat just a little bit, you're going to be more hungry, but it has been shown that a calorie restrictive diet uh, can actually be very beneficial to help someone with cancer. All right. Then once a month, I would recommend fasting for at least four days, but I would recommend going up to seven days if possible. That's once a month. And then when you eat, the main dish should be cruciferous vegetables, okay? And a lot of them. And so maybe your meal would have a base of broccoli, or maybe it would be kale or cabbage or cauliflower. And there's a lot of different great recipes that you can make with this base of cruciferous. Now, why would you recommend cruciferous? Number one, it's low in protein. Number two, it's low in fat. It's low in carbs. It has huge anti-cancer properties. It also has anti-angiogenic What's that? That is a property that helps to starve off the cancer of its blood vessels, okay? It's a thing I haven't talked about, but it's, it can help with that because if the cancer cells can't get a blood supply, they die. And cruciferous also help increase phase one, phase two detoxification of your liver, helping to minimize carcinogens. So I would recommend about 10 cups, okay, per day. Now, if you're doing OMAD one meal a day, that would just be 10 cups in that one meal. Now, as a side dish, you would wanna have low protein, okay? Not high protein. So maybe it's like three ounces of protein. The type of protein I would recommend would be uh, protein high in omega-3, fatty fish, sardines, you know, even cod liver, things like that. Omega-3 fatty acids are very, very, very beneficial when someone has cancer. Now, as far as fat goes, olive oil would be uh, probably one of the best fats that you can consume. It has wonderful anti-cancer properties. And cod liver oil being omega-3, apparently, even though it's a fat, won't turn into ketones and won't feed the cancer, the raw material for its membranes. Now, if you can add cruciferous sprouts, as in broccoli sprouts, you'll have even a more potent effect on this cancer. And of course, you want to avoid cheese and soy and conventional foods that have pesticides. You want to do mainly organic now, of course, I'm just telling you the ideal situation, okay? Not everyone is going to be able to eat this way. Now, the main reason why we are doing this study is to figure out what we can do to not only enhance the benefits of fasting, but also to come up with a method of blocking this chemical pathway, this door called SCOT, which would really be beneficial for those people who just cannot do fasting, whether they're too thin or they're too frail, or they just can't do it. We're trying to find out the results of what would happen if someone didn't fast and just did these nutritional protocols. But I think ideally, if you did fasting and these nutritional protocols would really be a very good strategy. Last thing I want to mention is unfortunately, the success rate, the effectiveness of chemo and radiation are very, very, very minimal. But I want to emphasize the prevention of cancer is the most important thing you can do right now. If you're new to my channel and you want to learn how to do healthy keto and intermittent fasting, I have a very short playlist right here. Check it out.